It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. When Martin Luther published his 95 theses in October of 1517, he had no intention of starting a revolution, but he became a rebel and the Reformation took off. And then the Reformation rebelled against Luther, and we're still dealing with the consequences 500 years later. At least that's how historian Brad S. Gregory tells the story in his book, Rebel in the Ranks, Martin Luther, the Reformation, and the Conflicts that Continue to Shape Our World. Brad Gregory is a professor of European history at the University of Notre Dame, and he joins us in this episode to talk about his brand new book. He'll also be in Provo on September 15th at the Maxwell Institute's Living Reformation Conference, celebrating 500 years of Martin Luther. You can learn more about that at mi.byu.edu slash luther500. We hope to see you there. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast.b... See, it's hard. Mipodcast at byu.edu. And don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes. It's never too late. Brad S. Gregory joins us today. He's a professor of European history at the University of Notre Dame. And we're talking about his book, Rebel in the Ranks, Martin Luther, the Reformation, and the Conflicts that Continue to Shape Our World. Brad, thanks for being on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thanks very much for having me. It's good to be here. I was wondering if you were ever bored in history class in like junior high and high school. (laughs) That's a good initial question to ask a a professional historian. You know, actually, most of my very earliest uh, history teachers were pretty good, certainly enough to get me um, intrigued and interested. Like like many uh, American school children, I suppose I was first captivated by American history partly because of not really knowing much about the history of the rest of the world. But I had good early history teachers, uh, but it really wasn't until I was an undergraduate and had some very inspiring professors at Utah State University, actually, just a little ways up from up the road from BYU. I'm from the Midwest, but I thought I wanted to study forestry or wildlife science, so I ended up at, at, at USU. But I had some great professors there, and I also spent a junior year abroad in Belgium. And that's really what first piqued my my serious engagement and interest in European history. So where did you grow up at? I'm from the uh, Midwest originally, uh, northern Illinois, uh, northwest of uh, Chicago, a small town called Woodstock. has absolutely nothing to do with the famous rock concert in upstate New York of the same name. However, it is, for listeners that might be interested, it is the town in which the romantic comedy Groundhog Day was shot. So that was not Punxsutawney, that was Woodstock, Illinois. So... If you've seen and, and, and enjoyed Groundhog Day, you've seen the city square in the little town where I grew up many, many times because of the, the plot of that movie. So <laughs> It's a great movie. <laughs> a, a strange little aside. Yeah, well. We'll put in a plug for, for Bill Murray. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Bill Murray. Yes, and Annie McDowell. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so what eventually brought you to specialize in history for your career? That was, I mean, uh, as I mentioned a little bit before, that it was the experience of um, – experience of, of living in, in Belgium for a year as a junior year abroad and traveling quite a bit and simply being exposed to the many more deeper, uh, deeper layers of history and um, a longer past there than um, we typically uh, encounter in terms of the built environment that it's sometimes called in the United States. I mean, the U.S. is a very young country, comparatively speaking. Um, and when you go to Europe and you see everything from, you know, Greek and Roman ruins all the way through medieval monuments and surviving buildings to the, you know, extraordinary buildings that survive from the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries and, and more recently, just the sheer kind of architectural and, and urban surroundings inspires a kind of wonder in that respect. And I also had a very serious interest in the history of Western philosophy, also stemming from my undergraduate years. And so those, those two kinds of things um, inspired, I suppose, my, uh, my initial forays into thinking about history as a career. Yeah, there's something about, in other countries, you notice a deeper sense of time because of some of the, the structures, some of the places that you can go that do have a much deeper, obvious past than some of the places in the United States, it seems like. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the, generally speaking, again, we have to, in a sense, keep in a separate category, of course, the, the archaeological remains of, of indigenous peoples in the United States, mm-hmm. uh, what is now the United States. But if we set that to the side, just for the purposes of, I think, how most Americans think about the past, 
particularly as you go further west in the United States, and certainly by the time you get out to the Intermountain West and you know, Utah and its surrounding states, let's have an extraordinarily young um, built environment. Yeah. I mean, really uh, 150 years old, um, or maybe a bit older than that for the earliest um, you know, the earliest explorations and so forth, but it is, um, extraordinarily new by, um, let's say a European, uh, or Eurocentric standards. And, and your book Rebel in the Ranks, it, it tells the history of the Reformation. And it seems like you were driven in this project by, by an, an abiding sense that what happened five centuries ago still deeply affects us today. Here's a quote from you. You say the Reformation ended the middle ages and made the modern world. And we'll get more specific about that later, but for now, uh, what are some quick points of that influence that you would emphasize? The aim of the book is um, really trying to ask the question, I think it's a fair question, of any would-be reader. Thousands of books are published, there's all kinds of things people can spend their time on, and in this year of 2017, 500 years after the traditional uh, beginning point of, of the Reformation, Martin Luther's 95 Theses, why should someone who perhaps doesn't have any personal investment, maybe is not a religious person at all, why should they take the time to think about, care about, and try to understand the Protestant Reformation and the changes that it wrought 500 years ago? And it seems to me um, one reason for doing so, and again, my point is regardless of one's own particular religious or secular views today, is that our world the world we're inhabiting today in the early 21st century, its institutions, its, its widely uh, shared practices of uh, consumption, its huge range of different uh, views about what to believe and how to live is the unintended long-term outcome of changes that were fundamentally set in motion in the 16th century with the religious uh, disagreements and disruptions uh, of the Reformation era. So that's the short answer. Right. And give us a broad picture of what the world was like five centuries ago. Some of the basics, like what it was like to live there, uh, economic considerations, housing, health. What was it like to be in the world five centuries ago? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that it's, it's at once one of the most basic, most important, but also I think for early 21st century um, Americans or Europeans, one of the most difficult things to try to get our heads around. The sheer sort of um, material hardship of the vast majority of people, and even indeed the wealthiest nobles or, or um, rulers at the time, you know, living in stone castles, a world before, of course, anything resembling uh, modern conveniences, uh, no electricity, no, no gas lamps even, obviously no central heating. I mean, living in a stone castle that's heated by a bunch of uh, fireplaces, you know, that's not exactly a, a luxurious uh, existence if you're Henry VIII or King Francis I of France. The, the, the other thing that I would um, call attention to is just the, the overwhelming reality for most people is an agrarian, rural existence, working the land in one way or another. Cities and towns are disproportionately important because they're the centers of uh, usually of uh, political activity, of cultural institutions, of educational opportunities, of commerce as well. But they're also extraordinarily small and thin. I mean, one of the most dramatic examples I like to give of this is England around the year 1500. The city of London is the only real city in England. It has about 60,000 people in the early 16th century. There are only two other towns in all of England that have as many as 10,000 people in the early 16th century, Norwich and Bristol. So this is a very thinly populated world. It was a much different life, and that's what's interesting about how you're tying it to the present, is saying how much it affects the present, because it was also a very different world. Let's also look at Catholicism at the time, and, and the place of religion in society at the time. And there was diversity there that you talk about in the book. There was even criticism within the church. So when Martin Luther did what he did, it, it wasn't something totally out of the blue. Talk about the religious conditions. So I think the most important um, thing to grasp, and the biggest single difference compared to religion, even even, even countries like the United States, in which religion is still omnipresent, if you drive down the main street of a, uh, a small or medium-sized town, in, in most places in the United States, you're going to see multiple churches and so forth. You see religion in the news, etc. But what was so different about the, the uh, Western, uh, in Western Europe, or at the time known as Latin Christendom, was the fact that religion was, as I put it in the book, more than religion. 
That is, religion was not just somebody's individual beliefs and practices of worship and whatever individual devotional practices of prayer or, or whatnot they might choose to engage in. Religion was intended to inform and influenced politics, public life, economic transactions, family relations, education, uh, morality, gender norms. All of these things were influenced by and intended to be influenced by Christianity, by the church. I mean, quite simply, really, as a kind of outgrowth of the, the, the very basic assumption that, that nothing is outside of God's creation, that God's will has been revealed, and the caretaker of his will is the church, is the instrument that makes possible salvation. So, of course, politics, the exercise of power, education, and so forth, ought to reflect those things. Religion as more than religion. The reason that's so important, then, is because a fundamental challenge to what Christianity is, what its basic doctrines are, the way that God relates to human beings, how human beings are saved, and so forth, which is precisely what the Reformation is. A fundamental challenge to religion is more than religion is going to affect everything else besides religion considered in a strict and narrow sense. So that's why this, this character of Christianity on the eve of the Reformation is so important. It's a world characterized, as you mentioned just a moment ago, by both thriving piety, by extraordinarily local variety, but also by criticisms, recognition for a very long time, indeed centuries before the Reformation, uh, of problems, of shortcomings, of corruption, of things that need to be changed. The, the character of those changes and what differentiates what came before the Reformation for the most part is that the rejections of the authority of the Roman Church, of the Pope, tend to be contained and controlled before the 16th century. If we look at the medieval uh, movements that are deemed to be heretical and are suppressed, they don't have a widespread transformative influence. Martin Luther comes along, the Reformation takes place, and this is the transformative influence that differentiates itself from all of the other preceding movements. And I want to zoom in just a little bit further before we get to Luther about the relationship between the state or, or the government and the church. Christianity was complex. As you said, it influenced every element of life. Was there a split between church and state prior to the Reformation? It seems like that would be a crucial part of the story that preceded the Reformation era. Yes, this, this is an interesting point, too, because sometimes you will hear rather glib commenters or journalists today say that, well, in the Middle Ages, you know, along the lines of what I've been trying to articulate here, like there wasn't a, a distinction between church and state that was all, you know, kind of combined and so forth. I actually think that's not a very helpful way to think about it. There is, without question, a very clear and often contested relationship between, let's say, political institutions. I, I say it that way way, um, because states in the modern sense are only just very embryonic at the time, in the late 15th and the, coming into the 16th century. But we have self-governing city-states in some uh, areas. We have territories in Central Europe that are trying to consolidate in ways that are going to feed into modern trajectories of political control. And we have, indeed, some of the, the important monarchies like uh, Castile, Aragon, the, the heart of what becomes Spain, England, France, and so forth. But in terms of a, the, the, there, there's no, there's no confluence of church and state. There is an institutional separation of church and state throughout the Middle Ages. The big difference, though, is that what we call the state is understood to be thoroughly Christian and with Christian obligations itself. So our assumption of thinking state, secular, church, religious doesn't apply at all in the Middle Ages or in the 16th century. The state, whatever form it takes, political power is supposed to be thoroughly imbued with Christian ideals. It's supposed to do its role in helping to make the society uh, Christian rather than not Christian. And the, the failures of political authorities to do that is one of the factors that inspires not only reforming efforts before the Reformation, but also Luther and other Protestant reformers in the 16th century. Do you think that might be part of what opened up the space for secularism, the idea that there's this separate thing away from religion? I know that that idea would be developed later on, but it seems like the very fact that the Catholic Church itself was not 100% e equivalent with government was kind of the cracking open of that door, almost creating a secular space. Um, I mean, I, I, I 
just don't think that that really holds up to the, um, the evidence of scholars of the Middle Ages and in the period that I study. Yeah, what, how would they depict it then differently? Well, just because you are not an ordained member of the clergy, right, and therefore part of uh, the church's clerical leadership, you're not a priest or a bishop or a cardinal or the pope, the fact that you're a layperson responsible for keeping order, for example, right, within a city or punishing crime, these things are understood thoroughly in Christian terms and mm -hmm. in ways that are supposed to dovetail with, acknowledge, and be in cooperation with the church's teachings and practices. So, for example, we have cities in the late 15th and early 16th century. The city government hires the preachers for Lent, for example, and Advent, the, the two important church seasons before Easter and Christmas, respectively. We have territorial princes who, if the church, if the, if the local bishop, for example, is not doing the job that it's, it's, it's thought he should be doing in terms of, say, reforming monasteries or friaries in a particular territory, well, the prince says, well, I'm going to do it then. This is essentially what Ferdinand of Aragon does in the late uh, 15th century in Spain. So uh, the, that's why, I mean, it's, it's misleading to think of non-ecclesiastical authorities as somehow secular, except in the very kind of formal sense that they're non-ecclesiastical. Okay. So a better distinction is ecclesiastical and non-ecclesiastical. Okay. All of them are Christian. They're understood to have their own jobs to do. And most of the conflicts, most of what we would call state church conflicts in the Middle Ages, are about who gets to exercise jurisdiction over what. It's not about what is Christian truth and how do we know it. That's the problem that comes uh, up as a result of the Reformation. Okay. Okay, good. And then... So far, things have been heavily male-centric because clergy and, and governmental authorities would be male. What about the place of women in the world at this time? In the, in the late Middle Ages, yeah. uh, up to the eve of the Reformation? Well, it's, I mean, this, the, the, whole, the whole period, not only the, the Middle Ages, but also into the early modern period, and indeed, um, as gender historians and, and scholars of the relationship between men and women have, have shown us over the last several decades, I mean, this is an extraordinarily strongly patriarchal world. There are very strong uh, views about the roles of men and women and so forth. And um, one of the, the there's kind of a, a, a back and forth uh, debate in recent decades about um, the relationship between opportunities for women on the one hand and the religious culture in which uh, women existed in, let's say, the pre-Reformation as opposed to the Protestant uh, uh, context of the 16th century. The argument essentially being that while the Reformation places a strong emphasis on the laity, and in that sense resists right the, the clerically dominated church of uh, the late Middle Ages, it also closes down for women the opportunity of participating in and taking religious vows as a member of a female religious community, mm -hmm. because the Reformation sweeps those away. And so um, this is a kind of argument thought about in terms of, you know, what were the opportunities for women in the Middle Ages or the early modern period? It's, in fact, it's a very modern question. It's a question that looks forward to modern self-determination, autonomy, free choice as a kind of guiding thread through history. One looks back and sees where is this anticipated, where is it not? But the fact of the matter is that certainly opportunities for women in general are much more limited in both the 15th and the, the 16th and 17th centuries than they are and become uh, subsequently. Mm -hmm. There are some exceptions. The, the few, you know, sort of dramatic ex ex exceptions are almost always uh, powerful women who are born into aristocratic and or royal families. And in a few dramatic cases in the 16th century, for example, come to rule in their own right, of course, like... Uh, Mary Tudor, and then um, her half-sister, Elizabeth I, in, in England. Your attention to those type of questions, for example, the idea that a stereotype might exist, that the Protestant Reformation really opened up more spaces for women when, as you note, there were different types of spaces for women that were foreclosed on because of the Reformation. Do you think attention to that kind of detail comes because of your own background? I, I, from what I understand, you come from a Catholic background, correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's think, correct. Did that has I mean, helped you um, attend to that? Um, I mean, I think so. I think, I mean, perhaps that's the case. Uh, that's not sort of, you know, Catholic uh, insider knowledge. I mean, it's historical, uh, evidentiarily based knowledge that's accessible to anybody who 
you know, reads this uh, scholarship and, and thinks about these questions. I try very, very hard to uh, make sure that whatever um, my particular religious views might bring to bear on my scholarship uh, has a sort of positive and insightful quality to them and, and never um, a detrimental or um, a biased one. I, the arguments that I make are all arguments that are based on evidence accessible to everyone. There's, there's never a point in my scholarship where um, I say that because I am Catholic, therefore X and so was the case. It's about the evidence. It's about the historical trajectory and about the interpretation of that in relationship to uh, what happened subsequently. That seems like it could raise a difficulty for you as well. Have you received any criticisms from Catholics who see you taking this more even-handed approach, which as a result includes some critical comments about the Catholic Church? Do you get any pushback from Catholics who feel like you're not being defensive enough of Catholicism? <laughs> well, I mean, again, if, yeah, the, the short answer is yes, I do. <laughs> uh, and, and my answer to them is is very similar. It, it has a different focus, but it is the same kind of criticism that I would make of somebody from a determinedly Protestant background or indeed from certain kinds of secular liberals who will say, for you, you know, you, you, in your criticisms of the contemporary world, right, you, you emphasize only the things that are problematic, nothing that is good, which is also not true. But if you read my scholarship a certain way and only look for those things, then that's what you'll find. So, the fact that I, I suppose very different kinds of critics, certain sorts of uh, Catholics, some types of Protestants, and some uh, secular liberal sorts um, all find fault with my scholarship, albeit in different ways, suggests to me that uh, I've probably hit things about um, <laughs> about right. But I'm always, for me, it is always about it's always about the interpretation of the evidence. I'm always willing to listen to counter arguments. You didn't consider this body of evidence. What about so and so, and so forth? And so I always try to redirect criticism back in that direction. It is thoroughly unprofitable in my in my view for uh, anyone in uh, not only my specific field but the academy in general to make an ideologically based criticism of someone else, but then bring no evidence to bear. Mm -hmm. um, that so-and-so is a hardcore atheist is neither here nor there if they're a great historian of Puritanism or, you know, uh, the Car Carthusians in the Middle Ages. Yeah, when people hear the word ad hominem, that, that's what would be ad hominem, is to dismiss what they say Absolutely. because of who they are. Not, ad hominem is not like saying someone's a dum-dum or something. That, that's just a no. Ad no, hominem is it's because you're because you're a such and so, yeah. right? Because you're a such and so, your your interpretation is biased. Well, right. it might be biased, but it's not because I'm a such and so. You right. Have to show or and actually bring forward the evidence. Right. Why do you think it's wrong? So this is frustrating. I mean, I've defended other um, other uh, writers and scholars of, from this kind of accusation and, and 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 written things about this as well, but. Yeah, That's Brad S. Gregory. He's uh, talking to us today from the University of Notre Dame, and soon he will be joining us here at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, for the Living Reformation Conference on September 15th, and we invite you, if you're nearby, to come and join us there. Brad, I previously interviewed Craig Harleen, who is one of the organizers of that conference, and who wrote a book on Martin Luther. He provides a nice overview there uh, in an earlier episode, so we'll touch a little bit on some of those things as well. And one thing that stuck out to me is how you sound a note of caution, that we shouldn't simply view the Reformation as Luther's Reformation, or that we shouldn't think about rival ideas or different movements as just being deviations from Luther and Luther's baseline. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Right. Yes, that's, um, that's certainly um, one of the kind of keynotes of um, my interpretation of the Protestant Reformation is that on the one hand, it's absolutely indispensable that we start with Luther. And I think um, Craig's book, A World Ablaze, does a terrific job of this. It's a wonderfully readable, very mm -hmm. gripping account of these, these early years in Luther's career. He, when he first emerges as a public figure between 1517 and 1522, we have to start with Luther. But as soon as Luther becomes a public figure, as soon as he becomes, at that time, the most published author in European history since the invention of the printing press in the 1450s, the principle that he articulates on which he takes his stand that not only justifies, but in his view, compels him to reject the papacy as anti-Christian, as diabolical, as um, inspired by Satan, 
The principle, Scripture alone, is a self-sufficient basis for the determination of Christian faith, in terms of the content of the doctrine, Christian life, what is it that Christians ought to do and how ought they to live. That principle immediately escapes Luther's or anyone else's control. Which he didn't it want to happen. inspires, not at all. Well, I mean, had, he didn't want it to escape his control, that's for sure. That it becomes the kind of widespread, unexpected movement in the early 1520s that it does, in some, mo- in some moments, Luther thinks, this can only be the work of God. You know, he really did call me as a prophet, despite myself, in, in, in certain ways. And it's obviously evidence of the hand of divine providence in history. However, when those who are inspired by Luther's principle, their, his calls to the gospel, his appeals to ordinary people, to search the scriptures, to understand the word of God for themselves, when those people come with understandings of the gospel that are at odds with Luther's, he immediately attributes their uh, interpretation and their actions to the devil. So it's, it's absolutely misleading to say um, that somehow Luther wanted people to read scripture for themselves. The critical caveat is so long as they agreed with him. Right. Uh, and from very early on in his career, even when he comes back, and I'm sure Craig talked about this too, he comes back from hiding out in the Wartburg Castle in, in the spring of 1522, and he takes back control of what's been going on in his town of Wittenberg uh, in the 10 months since he's been absent. And essentially, his main rival and the alternative leader in his absence of the Reformation in Wittenberg, Andreas um, Bodenstein von Karlstadt, is essentially forced out of the town. So right from the very beginning, the principle of sola scriptura does not, in no point throughout the entire 16th century, does it lead to a unified Protestant opposition over against the Catholic Church. Unwanted Protestant pluralism is coextensive with the very beginning of the Reformation. And that's, Luther is critical for articulating that principle. But then the question arises, well, how do you interpret scripture? What do you do when people disagree about it? Is a particular disagreement sufficient to warrant that we're not going to worship with you? These questions run straight through the Reformation era on the Protestant side, and they distinguish it to a large extent, from the emphasis in Catholicism on obedience, on tradition, and a greater emphasis on the importance of the papacy as the sort of symbolic and administrative center of Roman Catholicism. Okay, and I want you to keep that in mind as as we go through the next couple questions here, as as something that I think as we go through the history here, you can show people and trace how it played out. So in retrospect, looking back at the Reformation, historians have tended to group different perspectives together into two general categories. You have magisterial Protestants and radical Protestants. Uh, Your book, Rebel in the Ranks, does a great job. It's a great companion to Craig's book because it tells the aftermath more, whereas Craig's book kind of ends there. So let's talk about those two big categories. We'll start with magisterial. And one example of that would be like Zwingli's Zurich. This is 400 miles southwest of Martin Luther, this Swiss city. Right. Yes. That's So the distinction between magisterial Protestants on the one hand and radical Protestants on the other is essentially the difference between those expressions of Protestantism that worked with political authorities and conversely, Uh, enjoyed the support of political authorities in sustaining and carrying through their versions of what Scripture said, as opposed to the interpretations of the Bible and of Christianity that did not have sustained political support and control. So the the parallel or the, the kind of structural similarity between magisterial Protestants is with Roman Catholicism in those areas in which it also continues to enjoy the sorts of political support that uh, it enjoyed before the beginning of the Reformation. Uh, The odd Christians out, if you will, in this sense, are radical Protestants. They're the ones who find themselves without long-term shelters, without ways of uh, sustaining their views, and after particularly this this dramatic um, attempts to transform society on the basis of a a quite non-Lutheran, by the way, interpretation of the gospel, the, the uprisings or series of uprisings in the mid-1520s that we know as, as the German Peasants' War. After that, authorities really close ranks, whether they are uh, magisterial Protestants or whether they're Roman Catholics, and they really put the screws on and the clamps on anything that smacks of revolution, of political unrest, of socioeconomic leveling, 
we don't get a real outburst of politically significant radical reformers between the, the Anabaptist kingdom of Munster in the mid-1530s and the English Revolution of the 1640s. So magisterial Protestants, basically we're talking about Lutheranism and we're talking about Reformed Protestantism. Reformed Protestantism, Zwingli in Zurich, is, is one expression of that, and the other cities that are influenced by him in Switzerland, in southwestern Germany. And the other, much more influential, long-term expression of Reformed Protestantism, with which I assume most listeners will be familiar, is, of course, Calvinism. And that influence is, is one that comes especially out of his adoptive city of Geneva, starting in the 1540s. You mentioned the leveling idea, and this is where Martin Luther really differed from some of the other reformers here. He, it seems he didn't really, he wasn't too interested in figuring out how the gospel should inform the structures of society, so there could be great wealth inequality and these type of things. And then you had other people who believed that the gospel should basically remake society, and it all centered around this idea of Christian freedom. How would Luther have justified non-political involvement based on his understanding of the gospel? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question, and um, it's one that shows up especially dramatically in the way that Luther um, ends up responding to uh, the Peasants' War in 1525. For Luther, the gospel is the sort of port of refuge after decades of struggle in the monastery, after decades of trying to find what he calls the gracious God, to find God's mercy, forgiveness, to stop feeling as though he's got to constantly struggle against his sinfulness. And so the gospel means essentially God's unmerited gift of grace in the heart of the believer, transforming him or her, giving him or her a sense of tranquility, of gratitude, of unmerited forgiveness and uh, certainty about his or her salvation. It has nothing to do, therefore, with changing the hierarchies of society or with um, realigning uh, how politics is done. For Luther, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what the gospel is. Others in the early 1520s, and indeed, I think many historians would argue in larger numbers by the time we get to 1524 and 1525, they hear calls about the gospel the freedom of a Christian, appeals to the common man. And what they infer from that, what they draw from that, are those gospel passages that talk about the sort of fraternal, the communitarian, the shared, the right equalizing character of what Christianity means. Mutual love embodied in institutions and concrete practices and the fact that Uh, Human beings, after all, exist in a material world as well. So in this clash, this standoff, we have basically a totally different respective understandings of what the gospel means. And Luther not only condemns by April of 1525, not only condemns the rebellions, but urges, famously urges the princes and the other political authorities to stab, to smite, to slay. He says that when you kill a rebellious peasant, you are, uh, you, are doing, you are doing God's work. What specific things were the peasants asking for to change in society? Was it about money? What was it about? To a large extent, it's about a couple of things. One strand, and, and the other thing I should say too, is there were, a, there were a bunch of different petitions that are articulated. This fits into a tradition of late medieval peasant revolt in Germany. So this isn't the first time that this has happened, but the Reformation gives it a new edge, gives it a, gives it a new... Um, Uh, a new imperative. The traditional kind of elements in many of the the petitions that are articulated uh, in in the course of the Peasants' War include things like, we don't want to be, we don't want the these oppressive, ever increasing uh, extra taxes to be levied on us. It's, it's It's an unjust burden, more than we can bear. We used to be able to use for ourselves as well to have access to streams for fishing, to woods for gathering firewood or hunting, to uh, common areas for grazing. For example, you know, you've got two goats or you've got three sheep or whatnot, and and our, our feudal lords have taken those things away from us. But the other dimension that is injected by the Reformation and that makes 1524, 1525 so different from the earlier peasant uh, revolts is this appeal to the gospel. 
And so in the most widely reprinted set of, of demands by the peasants in, in, in early 1525, we have articulated this, this demand that either show us from the scriptures why we should be serfs or else we should be free mm-hmm. because Christ died for everyone, the wealthiest lord and the lowliest peasant alike. It's explicitly in there. They've got a vision of what a just society would look like that is dramatically at odds with the deeply embedded and institutionalized hierarchical assumptions of the world that they inhabit. So there's, there's both a traditional and a new aspect involved. And, and that's, I think, why 1524-25 is, is a, is, it's the largest mass movement in European history prior to the French Revolution. And this is where Calvin's emphasis on the sovereignty of God mattered so much in terms of everyday living, right? Because he was saying, we have a sovereign king, but in reality, God is sovereign over all. And so that was also a political protestation as much as a religious one. Yes, that's, yes. Reformed Protestantism and, and Calvinism, Calvin specifically, there is without question a more um, activist and a more, um, I would say, uh, politically inclined imperative in Calvin's understanding of the gospel than there is, for example, with Luther. Luther, Luther certainly wants political authorities and thinks political authorities ought to do what benefits the Lutheran church as it's being established in towns and territories. But it's enough to, in a sense, leave it to do its own thing. Uh, the, the, the political authorities have their responsibilities and they should let the church do what it wants to do. Calvin, in a certain way, has a transformed, hyper-conscious version of what I was describing before when I was talking about medieval Catholic political authorities, right, seeking to make their society more Christian. There's a there's a strong sense that political authorities absolutely should do their their part in making um, the institutions, the practices, the mores and so forth uh, in cooperation with church authorities. They should make these things conform to the gospel as Calvin understands it. And he wants to make his his city of Geneva into a kind of living human laboratory for the carrying out of those ambitions. Why did Calvinism become the most popular strain of, of the early Reformation? Yeah, it's, I mean, well, Calvin's really the second generation. I mean, he, um, he undergoes his conversion in the early 1530s, and it's, he, he comes to Geneva um, originally in, in 1536, but uh, tries to do too much too soon, is essentially forced out of the city, uh, goes to Strasbourg, relatively nearby, a German-speaking city, learns there kind of uh, how to do Reformation in a city, and then comes back in 1541. So he's a little bit later than the, the very first generation um, of the Reformation, the, the early Reformation of the Peasants' War and, and of the, the movement that Luther inspires. I mean, I think that Calvinism, to say that it becomes the, the most popular, to some extent it's because Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion is published in 1536. He's all of 27 years old, and it is, uh, right from the start, a very lucid articulation um, in a much more systematic way, for example, than Luther wrote of magisterial Protestant ideas, justification by faith alone, salvation by grace alone, the sovereignty of God, predestination of the elect and the reprobate, and it, and it has a kind of intellectual appeal in that sense. The other uh, way in which I think um, one of the reasons Calvinism becomes so um, so important is the kind of um, the sort of activist strain that is linked to what I was saying a moment ago about the sort of politically self-conscious engaged character of of Calvinism. They they want to transform their society in the the, the true Christian image as they understand it. And that has a, a greater appeal than, um, and, and, and just a, a simply a kind of um, more robust missionary impulse, I could put it that way, than, than say Lutheranism does, particularly after Luther's death in, in 1546. Lutheranism becomes the established and protected religion of the Scandinavian countries, of um, large chunks, but by no means all of Germany. But um, that, that's essentially it. Calvinism is going to cause unrest and foment um, religious conflicts in France, in the Low Countries, in uh, Scotland, and other areas of Europe as well. Mm. 
There's a quote that surprised me that I wanted to, uh, to point people to here. You say that one of the great paradoxes of the Reformation era is that even though the vast majority of Protestants in the period are either Lutherans or Reformed, the vast majority of Protestant interpretations of God's word belong to neither group. Yep. Yep, exactly. Those are, I mean, that's, that, is, that is putting um, in a, uh, I would say, a kind of pointed way, a corollary of what I was talking about earlier about the difference between magisterial and radical Protestants. So one of the things that I've tried to do in my scholarship is to, in a sense, turn on its head the traditional way in which we think about the, the Protestant Reformation in terms of all of uh, the Christians that it includes. The tendency has been to think of Lutheranism and Reformed Protestantism as that's sort of the, the mainstream, mainline Reformation. That's, that's the norm, because the vast majority of people who are Protestants belong to one of those two traditions. Perfectly true. The vast majority of Christians who formed an identity over a period of centuries came from one of those two traditions. Also perfectly true. However, the vast majority of Christians who rejected the Roman Church, the Catholic Church, and who were inspired in one way or another by the principle of Sola Scriptura, by the appeals to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the vast majority of those were neither Lutheran nor Reformed Protestant. There were many more different radical Protestant claims about what true Christianity is than Lutheranism or Reformed Protestantism, only two. So my my argument has been, in terms of those forms of Protestantism that enjoyed sustained political support, like Roman Catholicism, Lutheranism and Reformed Protestantism are actually the great exceptions of the Reformation era. Normal, if you will, interpretations of Protestantism, because they're much more numerous, are one or another form of radical Protestantism. Anabaptism, different forms of spiritualist Protestantism, like eventually the Quakers, uh, different forms of anti-Trinitarian Protestantism. Unitarianism is going to come out of that stream uh, by the time we get into this, uh, the 17th and the 18th centuries. So this is, a, this is my um, attempt, in a sense, to unsettle what seem to me um, ways of thinking about the Reformation that reinforce unquestioned trajectories, narratives about Protestantism and its relationship to Catholicism in the modern world. And you mentioned Catholicism as well. It obviously didn't go away despite it. No. it yeah, it obviously didn't go away. So how did, how did the Reformation change the Catholic Church? Oh, well, it's another huge question and a good one. Um, well, Catholicism, the, the first important thing to be said is that there are important, vital, vibrant forms of not only traditional piety, but also of reforming impulses within the Catholic Church before the Protestant Reformation ever comes around. So there, there's already reform underway in Catholicism uh, long before Luther. After the Reformation takes hold and once it puts down roots, um, the Catholic Church undergoes a, a kind of, I would say, an intensification and a focusing of those reforming impulses. A lot of these come together through um, uh, a very important uh, church council within Catholicism in the 16th century, the Council of Trent, that meets in three discrete periods between 1545 and, and 1563. And there we have a combination of both concerns with the doctrinal issues that have been raised by the Reformation, the Catholic Church um, formally and solemnly condemning the, many of the cornerstone doctrinal claims of Protestantism, justification by faith alone, the emphasis on scripture alone is sufficient for uh, determining Catholic faith and, or for Christian faith and doctrine and so forth, and also a lot of attention to the kinds of organizational and behavioral and disciplinary concerns within the church about the education of clergy, about the um, way in which the religious orders um, are living, about uh, certain kinds of widespread traditional devotional practices, like uh, the ways that images are portrayed, sacred images, um, sculpture, painting, stained glass, and so forth, about traditional pilgrimages, processions, and other religious um, practices that could be, and often were in the late Middle Ages, also the occasion for uh, just having a good time and perhaps more serious mischief-making. So there's, there are these kind of ways in which 
the Protestant Reformation and its challenge stimulates and uh, encourages, um, as it were, uh, as a response, um, uh, the, 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 the articulation, the reaffirmation of, of Catholic teachings and practices. And um, in the later 16th and the 17th centuries in particular, a, a renewed and much more vigorous and, and quite frankly, much more uh, militant Catholic Church uh, finds its footing and, and leaves an enormous mark, partly through the conflicts, um, the religio-political conflicts with Protestants. That's Brad S. Gregory joining us from the University of Notre Dame today. We're talking about his new book, Rebel in the Ranks, Martin Luther, the Reformation, and the conflicts that continue to shape our world. You mentioned, Brad, the militancy. The Reformation was a time of great violence. This is, I guess, I, I guess it could be seen as an irony. Uh, some views of religion uh, tend toward pacifism, so I guess it depends on how you define religion. But, but violence grew out of the Reformation, and you describe many of the massacres and wars, but you call them the wars of more than religion. Right. The, and the wars of more than religion, as a, a way of following on what I was talking about before, about religion being more than religion. So um, a conflict um, that involves religion in the 16th century, as for example, in the, the 1540s, the Catholic uh, uh, Emperor Charles V raises armies and uh, wages war against an alliance uh, of Lutheran territories and cities um, known as the Schmalkaldic League. Now, religion is central to that conflict, but because religion is more than religion, what's also involved are political concerns and as a result of Charles V's victory, then, right, what kinds of consequences are going to follow? There are going to be consequences for institutions, for everyday life, for education, and so forth. So whenever, that, that's the reason why the, the phrase wars of religion, I would say, is misleading is not because it wasn't about religion. It's because religion was about more than religion in the ways that we normally understand it. So these conflicts are, they're multivalent conflicts over the organization of, of politics, human society, morality, the character of the culture, because religion is embedded in and, and has ramifications for all of those things. And in the face of this violence, as it became clear that sola scriptura or, you know, scripture interpretation wasn't going to bring about unity, this changed Christianity. What, how did these wars of religion help lead to contemporary uh, separation of church and state and those type of things? So here, this is really the fulcrum between, um, this is where we end chapter three in, in Rebel in the Ranks is with these, these conflicts in, in some of the, the most contested um, areas in Western Europe, the Holy Roman Empire, France, England, and the Low Countries. And so by the time we get to the middle of the 17th century, with the end of the Thirty Years' War in 1648, which during the course of the previous 30 years has drawn in, in one way or another, virtually every major European country. We're in the period, uh, the mid middle of the 17th century of the English Revolution, the breakdown in effective political control, the efflorescence of socially and politically radical Protestant groups, um, the execution of an anointed king, Charles I, in 1649. And by the time we get to this, this these, these decades, I mean, to put it bluntly, Europeans have been exhausted by the attempts to try to win a war and sustain a victory of religion is more than religion. What happens and has been happening already uh, in decades prior to this is that one of those regions, one of these, in fact, a new country, the Dutch Republic, only comes into existence around 1580 as a result of and partly in, in relationship to one of these conflicts, namely that between Spain and the Low Countries. In the Dutch Republic, to put it bluntly, commerce is prioritized above religious uniformity. The Dutch figure out that toleration is good for business. And it's no accident that not only do we have a new understanding emerging in the Dutch Republic, not because anybody you know, laid down a great master blueprint, but because it's worked out in day-to-day -day interactions and the prioritizations of local political authorities who are also very often some of the leading commercial success stories, leading merchants in the towns of Holland, especially Amsterdam, above all. They have a prioritization of 
commercial success, mercantile activity above religious uniformity. And that goes together with religion being construed as being able to believe what you like, worship with whom you choose or not, and to engage in religious activities like do you want to you know, say the rosary in the privacy of your own home? Fine. But the official church in the Netherlands, in, in the Dutch Republic, is the Dutch Reformed Church. They're the public church, as it's called. People can worship, though, largely unmolested if they keep to themselves and, and don't try to go public with it. So we see this emergence of a split between private and public with respect to religion that is new. It's uncharacteristic of, say, Luther's world of a century before. And it's in that, it's in the, the kind of confluence of the redefinition of and constriction of the scope of religion, the extension or the beginning of the extension of some measure of religious toleration, and the prioritization of money making and the acquisition of material goods above questions about religious doctrine and, and practice. That combination is going to be the seed that, that's going to eventually transform the Western world. And in your book, The Unintended Reformation, you have William Faulkner's famous quote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. This is an example <laughs> of how you draw that out, right? This idea that society's glue shifted away from public religion to things like consumerism and individualism. And you, <laughs> you don't seem unequivocally happy about that shift. Well, and uh, I mean, I think, you know, people with eyes to see and who, who reflect on the implications of that ought not to be unequivocally uh, pleased with it either. The emphasis, for example, let's take, let's take consumerism first, right? The kinds of connections are now just in the last few years starting to be made more steadily about the relationship between being able to buy as much as you want, as you want of whatever you want. The industrial processes of manufacturing that goes into making all that stuff. And, I mean, of course, in countries around the world, in right, outsourced uh, labor in countries like China, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Mexico, and so forth. And the environmental cost of all of that industrial production, including petroleum power vehicles and so forth. So we have to think about the connections between things like politically protected individual human rights, right? Thumbs up, good thing. Among those rights, the right to buy whatever you want, you know, as much as you want. If you want, without concern for anybody else, right? There's no compulsion to care about anyone else in, in, in that endeavor. The ways in which those things are manufactured in global industrial capitalism and the environmental crisis that we now face vis-a-vis -vis both uh, concerns with the environment and overarching it all, of course, climate change and global warming. So if somebody thinks, you know, individualism and consumerism is all to the good, I don't think they've thought through the connections of, between those things and, let's say, climate change. And this is, again, unintended of aftershocks course. of the rest. Totally. Absolutely. And that's why, and I say in the book, if, if Luther and Calvin could see the long-term tangled, unintended consequences and outcomes of where their and their colleagues' actions led, I think they would be, they would be horrified. Although it's probably not climate change in the environment that would, would shock and appall them most. It would be the sheer fact of people believing so many false things from their point of view and simply doing basically an attitude of whatever uh, rather than uh, the, the proper from Luther's understanding of here I stand with this interpretation of scripture, with this understanding of what Christian truth is, and with this understanding of how Christians ought to shape and live in society. Because what we've ended up with as a long-term outcome of the unresolved conflicts, the never-ended theological disagreements between Protestants and Catholics in the Reformation era, what we've ended up with is uh, a highly secularized society that's become secularized paradoxically through the political protection of religion understood in this much more narrowly defined way. So you can believe whatever you want, worship in whatever church you want. It's not going to make a hill of beans a difference on the, the extent or the, the, the um, pervasiveness of uh, contemporary global capitalism.
I don't know who wrote the press release for Rebel in the Ranks, but it has this great headline where it says that uh, the book showed how the Reformation movement rebelled against Luther. Uh, and that's – so, you know, Luther is yeah. a rebel, and here's this movement rebelling against him. That's right. Yeah. From the get-go, from the very, very start. And you've just – It's described. not like, you know, Luther was in charge for a decade, and then, you know, a few people decided he didn't have everything right. There were people from the very outset that said, great, great on you, Luther – for getting rid of the papacy, we agree, God's word, God's word rightly understood, but you got it wrong. You got it wrong on infant baptism, or you got it wrong in your understanding of the Lord's Supper, or whatever the case may be. And you've mentioned a few things, but give us a, a few other examples of things that he and other reformers might be disconcerted by today if they, if they visited in a time machine. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <sighs> wow, where, where to start? The, I would think the, the, maybe the first thing that would strike them would be simply the kind of um, the day-to-day lack of obvious expressions of Christian piety, evidence of Christian virtues, um, the extent to which um, autonomy and self-determining individualism is simply pervasive and taken for granted as a kind of cornerstone value of the society. I mean, they would, they would, I think, regard this as a society that has been completely given over to human beings and what human beings want to do and has completely lost sight of the truth of God's self-disclosure, his revelation in the scriptures, and what his will is for human beings. The other thing that would certainly shock them beyond belief is the, the pursuit of ever more and, and better stuff as though this was the high road to human happiness or the point of human life. I mean, the kind of, you know, hamster wheel pursuit of, of wealth, of goods, of uh, material possessions. Um, I mean, I, I argue in the unintended reformation that American Christians seem to have been involved in a, in a, a for the entire history of the country in a, in a long de facto effort to prove Jesus wrong. You know, when he says your life does not consist in abundance of possessions, American Christian Christians for the most part have essentially responded. Uh, yes, it does. And um, when he says you cannot serve both God and mammon, American Christians by and large have responded. Uh, yes, we can. And uh, I think that would shock Luther and Calvin uh, beyond measure, too. Luther was even even more critical of um, sort of hedging on traditional condemnations of greed than were uh, the scholastic theologians that, um, in other respects, he, he criticized so heavily. Now, your chapter in Unintended Reformation about commercialism is, is fascinating. There's another chapter in Unintended Reformation that talks about how some people have tried to use philosophy and reason as a way to bring about peace and unity. So one of the problems the Reformation brought up was disagreement, discord, in some cases war. And so you say, okay, if we can't do it with scripture because people can read different things, then you have philosophers say, well, let's use, let's use reason instead. And you say that these efforts have also failed and have caused a lot, a lot of Okay. Discord and I mean, it, it's all, I think it all makes perfect sense seen retrospectively and understood historically why that happened. It's no accident that modern philosophy, and I studied philosophy, I have a couple of degrees in, in philosophy, that's what I studied in Belgium. Um, it's, it's no accident that modern philosophy begins in the 17th century. It begins in the 17th century in the midst of the Thirty Years' War. Descartes, Rene Descartes, father of modern philosophy, fought in the Thirty Years' War as a, as a young man. And um, it's understandable why they would say, look, what we have to do is set these things aside. The things that are causing the conflict, the recurrent difficulties and the disagreements about theology, about doctrine, about God's word, and on the basis of reason alone, which everybody has access to, right? We're going to articulate what morality is, what a good society looks like, how our politics should be organized and operate and so forth. And if we can do that, insofar as everyone is re- rational, everybody should be able to come to agreement. Fast forward to the late 20th century, and what we really see in postmodernism, post-structuralist philosophy that critiques this whole what's called a foundationalist uh, project of modern philosophy, the, the, the attempt to establish rational foundations 
that so everyone would agree on. Yeah. Exactly. What postmodernism is, is a calling out of this project as a failure. It is to say, you know, for all the valiant efforts, for all the great thinkers, you've got, you know, the utilitarianism of John Stuart Mill set over against the deontological ethics of Immanuel Kant. And people have been arguing in those two basic veins, for example, and this is just within moral philosophy, for the better part of two centuries. So modern philosophy tried to solve the problem on the basis of reason alone that Protestantism had tried to do on the basis of scripture alone. But it too has now failed. And in the kind of increased evidence, I think, of the extent to which the, the assumed cultural and social foundations of Christianity that remain so much a part of the modern era, to the extent that we see those dissipating in recent decades, we have a greater insight into why we're facing the sorts of angry, divisive, divided problems that we see so dramatically around us not only in the United States, but in different manifestations in Western European countries. And I wonder how you'd situate your work then in terms of the history you've just laid out, because you also rely on reason and, and training in universities and things like this to help solve some of these intractable problems. And so in some ways, your work's also an inheritance of the Reformation as well. How do you continue to do it without feeling like it's ultimately futile? Well, I mean you'll find no bigger defender of reason properly deployed in my view than, than me. I mean, I'm, I'm all about evidence and argument about real news, not fake news um, about when <laughs> something is mistaken, people critiquing it and so forth and so on. The, the kind of, of what I was just talking about a minute ago about modern philosophy is an attempt to ground answers to the most basic questions about human life, questions about morality and meaning about priorities and purpose, about metaphysics, about what we should live for and why and so forth. That's a different, that's a much more ambitious uh, goal of reason than is the attempt to understand historical change over time or how these conflicting views have led to the situation we're in and so forth. So too, it's a different understanding and a use of reason than we find in modern science, which is extremely controlled, self-conscious, trying to, to understand one or another level of, of natural causality and natural phenomena within the natural world. So I'm all for that. It's done its job incredibly well. The difficulty is that over the things that are most important in human life, the things that cause right, social angst, political conflict, moral disagreement, uh, culture wars, those kinds of things, we've not come upon a replacement for Christianity in some form, for the ambitions of modern philosophy in some form. Uh, another religious tradition has not come in, right, to, and it, as it were, persuade people and save the day. And so what we have is politically protected individual liberalism in which technologically sort of captivated individuals buy what they want to buy and engage in the kinds of disagreements and conflicts that they disagree in. And this, it seems to me, is descriptive of the world around us. And so I'm, I'm all about reason, but I, I, I am definitely not in the tradition of foundationalist modern philosophers who think if we just go back to the, the rational drawing board and, and think harder, we're somehow going to come up with a solution to these problems. That's Brad S. Gregory. He's a professor of European history at the University of Notre Dame and an award-winning author of books like Salvation at Stake, uh, and the Unintended Reformation, How a Religious Revolution Secularized Society. Today we talked about his latest book. It's called Rebel in the Ranks, Martin Luther, The Reformation, and the Conflicts that Continue to Shape Our World. Brad, we look forward to having you come out to BYU. What else have you got in the pipeline right now? I have a lot in the pipeline in terms of uh, talks and travel this fall. This is the, the, you know, the big 500th anniversary autumn of uh, the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. So as I joke with colleagues, I'm, I'm saying, you know, once January 1st, 2018 comes around, people will forget about us again. So we have to take, have to take advantage of these opportunities as they present themselves. And then 500 so years, couple, then after 500 more years, though, uh, people will come well, back. Well, yes, maybe so. Who knows? Maybe in the, t the, the 600th <laughs> anniversary, I'll be long gone by then. And, you know, who knows what, uh, what kind of world we'll be living in by then. Um, I have uh, other projects I'm working on, one about the sort of long-term rival views of human nature from basically the reintroduction uh, of or, or introduction of Aristotelianism in 
uh, medieval Europe all the way up to the present. So it's a similar methodology to um, the unintended reformation, but it would concentrate especially on that and then follow the, the trajectory through with the, the use of a lot more primary sources and, and uh, kinds of evidence than I was able to bring to bear on the much more um, compressed uh, exposition of six different trajectories in the unintended reformation. I've also toyed with writing a book um, called something like Why History Matters for a General Leadership. And I think it's something particularly important for Americans. In contrast to Europeans, you mentioned this very early on in our conversation about, you know, the, the greater sort of presence and awareness of the past that one finds in many of those countries compared to the U.S. And not only that, but there's also a, the U.S. has to a very large extent, um, been a country shaped by its sort of vision of the future. Not, we don't want to be tied down by the past. We don't want to think about, you know, uh, traditions or customs or the way things have always been done. We want to, we want to innovate. We want to look to the future. We want to be bold and entrepreneurial. And that's all to the good, um, as far as it goes. But it seems to me to do that without an awareness of where you've come from, whether you're aware of it or not and the ways in which the past has shaped and indeed made the present what it is. If you lose sight of that, you're going to strike out and engage in certain kinds of endeavors that are going to cause um, difficulties, and you're not going to be aware of why they're causing the difficulties they are. And so I hope to be able to make some kind of contribution on that front. Hmm. Well, I look forward to that. And I appreciate you taking the time today, Brad. Thanks for being on the show. It was a great pleasure. Thanks very much for having me, Blair. 